Okay, you asked for it, so let's buckle up. Within the Internal Revenue Code, the term non-resident alien is a word of art. This term has a special use, different from what common sense and common logic dictates, just as the term employee. In the Internal Revenue Code is a word of art, which means an elected or appointed official of the United States. C-26 U.S.C. 3401 C and 26 CFR 31.340 C. The terms alien and non-resident alien are also defined in the regulations at 26 CFR 1.441-1 C. Let's go deeper. A natural person who lives inside the 50 states of the Union, which is outside of the federal zone, can be a non-resident alien without being an alien, which at first glance would appear to be a contradiction. One would ask, how can a person be a non-resident alien without being an alien? The answer is easy, because a non-resident alien, as defined in 26 U.S.C. 7701 B1, B, all caps, is someone who is not a U.S. citizen or a resident, which is what a national but non-citizen is, as defined in 8 U.S.C. 1101 A. 21 and 1101 A. 22 B. That same national can't be an alien because aliens can't be citizens and nationals at the same time, according to 26 CFR 1.1441-1 1 C. 3 I. The terms U.S. national and non-citizen U.S. national are equivalent and interchangeable. An examination of the IRS Form 1040 NR confirms the fact that U.S. nationals are indeed non-resident aliens. The federal government has tried to confuse private citizens so that they would discount being a private citizen. The term non-resident alien is a contradiction deliberately designed by lawyers to confuse us and to obscure the actual truth. All residents of the United States can only be aliens under the Internal Revenue Code. When we call someone a non-resident, we are saying he is not an alien. Non means not, am I correct? You see, if Congress were honest about the definitions they use, they would use the term non-resident national or foreign national instead of non-resident alien. In 26 CFR 1.1441-1C 3 I. And then they would have told us that this status under the Internal Revenue Code applies to people born in one of the states of the Union. If you like this so far, we'll come back with more. Let's continue our study course. A non-resident alien is non-resident to the United States as defined in the Internal Revenue Code at 26 U.S.C. 7701-A-9 and a 10 which simply means that he does not live in the district of columbia the federal united states the federal zone for short you see there's no way to interpret the definition of the united states other than the meaning district of columbia for the purposes of subtitle a federal income tax the constitution and federal law both confine all persons holding public offices to reside in the district of columbia the United States Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17. I quote, All offices attached to the seat of government shall be exercised in the District of Columbia and not elsewhere, except otherwise provided by law. End of quote. That's Title 4, Chapter 3, Section 72. A non-resident alien who does not hold a public office in the United States government is not responsible for income tax withholding under Subtitle C, of the Internal Revenue Code or for federal income taxes under subtitle A of the Internal Revenue Code. People not holding public office also cannot be levied upon under 26 U.S.C. 6331A. All income not effectively connected with a trade or business in the United States or earned from labor outside of the federal zone of the federal United States is exempt from exclusion as gross income and exempt from withholding. You don't believe me? C26 CFR 31.3401 A6-1. A portion of the regulation I stated is confirmed by the statutory rules for computing taxable income found in 26 USC 
861. Okay, listen to this. The United States includes no other places than the District of Columbia. Let me quote, a citizen of a possession of the United States, except in Puerto Rico and Guam, is treated as if he's a non-resident alien, an individual. See it for yourself in 26 CFR 1.931-1, status of citizens of the U.S. possessions. Here's another quote, an individual is a non-resident alien. If such individual is neither a citizen of the United States nor a resident of the United States within the meaning of the subparagraph A, C26 USC 7701B1B, one, B, non-resident alien. You'll see it for yourself. You see, Americans born in the states of the Union, i.e. in the United States of America and domiciled there are not citizens of the United States under the Internal Revenue Code or any federal law of the United States. Just abolish the federal government, which is the Constitution, for those that don't understand it. The con With all due respect, all joking aside, America is a land mass, okay? The United States is a corporation. The corporation does not rule the land mass. The corporation is a corporation, is a corporation, just like Walmart, Ford, or AT&T. And if you don't believe that the United States is a corporation, then go to Title 28, USC, 3002, Section 15, Clause A. It says, and I quote, the United States is a federal corporation. Okay? If you go to UCC, uh... Let's see, um, it's, uh, okay, I'm not good with the UCCs, but if you go to um, the Better Revised Statutes, NRS 205.4611, UCC 4-611, says the same thing as NRS 205.4611. It's been caught, the UCC has been codified into the Nevada Revised Statutes. Your state is the same thing. Every state in the union does. It's sort of like a prerequisite for commercialism. So anyway, the, uh, the United States is not the Constitution. The government is not the Constitution. The Constitution is what we are supposed to hold our government to, and we have not been doing that. Our government has been out of whack since 1933 when Roosevelt sold us out. Okay? You want to check some facts? Check some facts. You better ask somebody. All right? Be well. All rights reserved. And uh, void were prohibited by law. We are dealing with commercial matters. All right? So the commercial sense of the word which is number five, is an encumbrance, a lien. Let me put it on the screen. You can see right here, a charge is what? An encumbrance, a lien, or a claim, a charge on property. Now, when we go into the, uh, when we go into the courtroom, you've probably heard people say, when you go into the courtroom and people start talking, it's your time to speak, and the judge speaks to you, you could say something like, uh, Yana, do you have a charge against me? He probably is going to remain silent. And then you say, do you know anyone who does have a claim against me? He probably will still remain silent. Or you have a dumb prosecutor sometimes who will say something like, um, the state of Texas has a claim against you. At which point you can respond, Yana, would you I please uh, I request that the honorable judge direct the prosecutor to provide the assessment for the charges along with the certified audit trail of all transactions, including voucher, as well as all disbursement documents and receipts. The reason that you are saying that is because the prosecutor just admitted on the record that this is civil because he says there's a claim. When we have claims, it's civil in nature, which means there's some sort of pecuniary interest in the case. All right? You have a right to know all of the documentation associated with that claim. So when you say that, you say, I request that the honorable judge direct the prosecutor to provide the assessment for the charges, along with a certified audit trail of all transactions, including voucher, as well as all disbursement documents and receipts. All right, you're asking for an accounting. The judge is sitting on the bench, and he's a hearing officer. 
You do know that bench means bank. All right, bench means bank. All right, it's a bank. So we're doing banking in there. It's, you know, it's real and it's undercover everything that's going on. You will only come to know what's going on if you're asking questions. This is why they like to saddle you with an attorney, because when you have an attorney, you can't ask any questions. When you're represented by counsel, you're not allowed to speak. That's why your attorney tells you to be quiet, because you haven't made an appearance in the case to speak. He's representing the defendant, not you. Okay, you're not the defendant. He is. So when you've elected to have counsel represent you, you no longer are representing the defendant. Okay, now, in the beginning, for you to have to be uh, have the liability associated with the case, they need you to plead into the record. All right, that's why the most important step of any case is when they bring you into arraignment and they ask you, do you understand the charges? You always say this, Yana, I don't see any charges because they're just standing there. When you say, I don't see any charges, they're going to bring you your indictment or whatever piece of paper they got your charges on. They're going to bring it over and hand it to you. At that point, you look at it on the front and the back. You say, I don't see any charges. I request the honorable judge to, uh, I direct the, uh, I request that the honorable judge direct the prosecutor to read the charges into the record. If no one has read the charges into the record, there's no one with the associated liability. All right. What if you are innocent? Who's liable for that? Okay. Who brought those charges against you? That's why all of these public servants are bonded. All right. They have liability. How dare they arrest and uh, snatch somebody off the street and then take their freedom, the most precious thing that the creator of the balanced universe has given you is your freedom so they can make some money off of it. Your life and your freedom. And they take trying to take it from you. So I, first of all, we need to establish the liability of the party who's bringing the charges. And you won't do that. There's a presumption that you don't have any, you got to understand everything they do is all presumption, assumption, and color of law. You got to rebut every presumption. So if there's a presumption that you're not interested in the assessment of the charges, you need to rebut that. If there's a presumption you're not interested in the charges being read into the record, you need to rebut that. Sometimes you'll hear an attorney, he'll tell you, we are going to waive arraignment. Waiving arraignment, all that means is you're entering a not guilty plea into the record. A not guilty plea is a traverse. You have now traversed the charges. Let's look at the word traverse. Have you been to Antarctica? Yes. It's more of a time. Chapter 16, the causes of illness. Are they edible? Are they like chickens and cows and fruits? None of the animals are used for food. Some of the plants are edible. All the prototypes